evening and welcome to the June 16th, 2014 regular meeting of the Edina School Board. We do have a forum this evening. I'd like to call the meeting to order. First item on the agenda is the approval of minutes. We had a special enclosed meeting on May 19th, a regular meeting on May 19th, a special meeting on June 2nd, a special meeting on June 9th, and a work session on June 10th. So please get a motion uh, to approve the minutes. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes. Any additions or corrections uh, to the minutes as written? Seeing none, all those in favor of approving the minutes as uh, presented, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, do we have any requests from members of the audience to speak this evening? We do not. Uh, we'd like to proceed to uh, recognitions. Rick? We have two recognitions tonight. First of all, we want to recognize uh, some teachers who have been doing some amazing things. Uh, our deaf and hard of hearing teachers who uh, were recognized by the state, so we'd ask them to come forward. Jennifer Duncan, Molly Krantz, and Molly Nackenrood, if they would come forward. So earlier this spring, we get this letter from the Department of Education talking about some of the great advancements that occurred with our students who are in the part of the deaf hard of hearing program and uh, the accomplishments they had that was so strong that they decided that they need to have a visitation team come out and learn about what's going right in Edina. So when you heard about it, what was the feelings, what was the thoughts of uh, getting that, that letter from the department? Well, we were actually nicely surprised. Um, you know, we just keep our nose to the grindstone and keep working. So to find that our scores were exceeding the expectations, that was great. And Molly, talk a little bit about some of the work that you do, the type of programming that you do that's a little bit unique uh, given the students and some of the uh, special needs they have of how you respond and help them uh, really maximize their learning experience. Um, we uh, have the great opportunity of working with children from birth to all the way up to age 21. So we get to watch kids grow and we get to um, be a part of their experience all the way through. So um, what's really unique about our position is that we get to go from school to school. We're itinerant teachers, and we get to serve them in the schools that they're, they're in. And so um, I, it's a wonderful experience. And Molly, talk a little bit about, too, uh, what, you, you know, what, what, what we learned from the visit and what, what are some of the things that, as you think about when the department was out here and some of their, their experts are in the field uh, taking a look at the work, what were some of their findings? Well, the, just the recognition that the program that we've created, the, uh, the pull-out programs, the push-in programs with the kids is, is really, truly working, and um, that they're taking that information back to other districts and really trying to um, apply that there as well. So. Well, I do want to congratulate you. We have an amazing staff. Uh, our special education department is always recognized, but this is a standout effort so that we wanted to take time tonight to recognize our deaf, hard, and hearing teachers who serve these students in such a positive way, in a professional way, so we congratulate you on this great recognition. I'll ask Mr. Meyer to step in. Congratulations, thank you. thank you. And our spring season wouldn't be complete without a championship, state championship, so I'm going to ask the boys golf team and Coach Phil Fenonger to come up, please. It's a big piece of hardware. Yeah. Coach, did you ever think you were going to have a golf season? That's probably the first question. Raincoats tonight too. So, talk a little bit about the season. It took a long time to get going, but uh, as you as you looked at the team and you knew what the competition was out, uh, especially in the late conference here, what were your thoughts looking in, into the season and what kind of hopes did you have? We knew because of the last couple of years that we had a very strong team, and not only uh, these three boys, we have uh, three others who couldn't make it tonight who uh, were at the state, but uh, four others who were just waiting to uh, try to qualify for that top six and, and play. That made us more competitive uh, throughout the state because of the kids that we had within our team. And talk a little bit too, Coach, about just um, how that team things work. This is an individual sport that we always see it, but 
the power of team, the power of kids working together on you know what you typically see uh, working by yourself. But this really does become a team sport, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Uh, at the state, we uh, we didn't score higher than a 78, uh, which a lot of teams were having to take 80s, uh, 85s, 86s for scores. And so that just is a credit to our, our top group of players at the state that uh, uh, they played well. They, they shot low scores, 71 to 75. We did not count uh, over a 75. And so four scores count each day of the six. And um, we just really took it to uh, the other teams. Fantastic. So let's go down the road here to uh, names, grades, um, possibly what you're doing this summer besides uh, uh, studying, because I'm guessing there's probably a little bit of golf in there. Uh, I'm Sam Faust. I'll be a senior next year, so just finished my junior year. Um, this summer I'll be working hard on my golf game to be ready for next year. Sounds great, Sam. Uh, I'm Kobe Bo. I'm also going to be a senior next year, and I'm going to try to play as many national tournaments as I can this summer. I'm Drew Ingle King. I'm also going to be a senior next year, and uh, I'm going to play in a lot of golf tournaments too. Just keep going. So, Drew, what do you think it's going to take to do a, a repeat? You know that we hear a lot about that, but it's a, it's a junior squad this year, and you've know, got some strength coming up in numbers. What do you what are you hoping? Well, we're going to really just keep working hard, and uh, there's a lot of other great teams out there. Wazetta has a really strong team coming back next year, and so uh, we're going to have to play really well, but. Um, we're all really dedicated, and we're all ready to get back out there next year. So talk a little bit about summer golf, Sam and Drew, if you could, uh, a little bit of uh, plans on wh wh what that all entails and uh, how you keep running into the same golfers uh, throughout the state as you play. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I like to try to stay in Minnesota for a lot of the golf tournaments, but a lot of the good golf is down south. So uh, I'll try to play in as many qualifiers to get in some larger events. Um, you know, like just single day events. That's it. And Sam, you were bringing up the rear, as it were. On, and uh, did you have any idea where you were in the tournament? And you were um, shot driving the bunker. You had to put it on. Do you know where you stood as far as a team event? Yeah, I didn't know exactly. I had some idea. On the 18th tee, coach told me it was pretty close, and he said I think he said it was within one shot. So I thought it was really close coming down to the wire, and I thought I needed to make my 30-foot putt on the last hole to beat Wyzetta by one, but it turned out I just needed a two-putt, and we ended up winning by one. And what was that feeling once you saw the scores posted? And it felt good after because I thought it was uh, I thought we had tied after I finished the round, but it felt really good that we actually ended up pulling it off. Well, congratulations to you guys and your members that aren't there. And congratulations, Coach, on a, a great season. Not just uh, the championship, but everything around it. Thank you. And we are going to uh, take the trophy to, once we get our picture in there, to Edina Country Club for about a week, let them have it, show it off, and then Interlochen for a week, uh, and then to Braemar for a week. Great. Just because of what they give us. Fantastic. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations, team. Next up, we have our active routes to school presentation. Catherine Bass and Valerie Burke have been working on a joint city district task force uh, as it relates to safe routes to schools and uh, filed a report uh, earlier this year and have met uh, and I think have been presented this to the city council and tonight's their opportunity to present it to us. So we welcome them. Thank you. Oops. Hello. Uh, pleasure to be here. I've b worked with Catherine for the last three years. We were members of the uh, community leadership team for state health improvement dollars that have been coming in since 2011. There, it, starting in 2012, there were some dollars that were dedicated to safe routes to school. The city of Edina and the school district of Edina decided to partner to spend those dollars to hire a um, consultant, do a comprehensive um, active routes to school plan and Catherine's going to speak to you tonight about that. Thank you chair and members of the school board. I am delighted to have time on your busy agenda to talk about to talk about our active routes to school plan. Um, I'm going to do a quick background on kind of what it is and what the goals are and then tell you a little bit about the recommendations that are included in the plan. 
Um, active routes to school is a nationwide initiative to increase walking and bicycling to school. It's also sometimes called safe routes to school, but our planning group um, decided that our plan addresses many aspects of active transportation, and so we felt like active routes to school is a better fit for Regina. Um, just by way of the data, walking and bicycling to, bicycling to school has declined nationally from 50% in the 1960s to less than 15% today. Uh, and that certainly is true for Edina based on the data we collected in the plan. Um, and of course, you know that our school sites haven't changed location since the 1960s, so it can be attributed, that decline can be attributed to other, other reasons and other factors. Some of the benefits of walking and bicycling to school, um, of course, healthier kids, kids who walk and bike to school have higher rates of daily physical activity, which is associated with um, lower uh, obesity and lower rates of chronic uh, disease. And the funding, as Val mentioned, was provided through Bloomington Public Health from the Statewide Health Improvement Program, which is um, funds dedicated from the legislature to address obesity and reducing chronic disease in the state. Um, Obviously, other benefits to active routes to school, including less traffic congestion and associated air quality, but um, better academic performance. There is an increasing body of literature connecting physical activity to learning. And I'll say a little bit more about that since it's a benefit. I'm sure it might be of particular interest to the school board. Um, this graphic is pulled from a recent publication that was um, jointly produced with the Minnesota Department of Education and the Minnesota Department of Health called Moving Matters. It's a great publication around the connection between physical activity and learning. And this image shows um, groups of students, brain images of students after 20 minutes of sitting quietly and after 20 minutes of walking. And you can see how physical activity just really turns on the brain. Other research has shown that that effect can last up to four hours after arrival at school. So the goals of active routes to school are really twofold. Um, where it's safe, we want to get more kids walking and bicycling, and fix conditions where it's not safe. And as you might imagine, um, those two goals require somewhat different strategies. Uh, what I always like to make sure to cover what it's not. It's not about making every kid walk to school a walk or bike to school every day. In fact, it's not about making anyone walk or bike. Um, it's also not about eliminating the yellow bus, and it's not about eliminating cars. Um, we make a variety of transportation choices in our lives. They may differ every day. This is really about ensuring that we've thought through the supports that are needed when families decide to make an active choice in the same way that we've thought through the supports that are needed for the bus or the car. So why did we develop an active routes to school plan? Um, I'm currently the chair of the Edina Transportation Commission and I've been a part of the commission for about four years now. And a lot of the discussion that we've had in the last few years has been about the city's responsibility to meet all residents' transportation needs and that includes the needs of our youngest um, residents. So in part, this plan was really a first step toward envisioning a city where kids at a developmentally appropriate age can move themselves about more independently. We know through research that reduced independent mobility is linked to higher rates of obesity. It's also linked to reduced self-confidence and reduced emotional resilience. There's something about being able to navigate your world and navigate your neighborhood independently that really helps kids develop those sort of coping and emotional resilience skills. So that it was part of kind of co-creating that together, our first step toward that. Um, it also allowed us to take a look at a comprehensive set of improvements. Naturally, people think about the engineering supports that are needed to increase walking and biking, um, but it's it's not as simple as, as that. Uh, we also were able to talk about education, so the skills and the knowledge that are needed for kids to be safe walkers and safe um, bike riders. Encouragement, so what are we doing to motivate and kind of uh, create a culture of support for um, walking and biking to school, enforcement, making sure everyone's following the rules, and evaluation, making sure that we're you know, making progress on, on these recommendations. And then also, um, a big part of the reason we wanted to develop this plan was to seek funding opportunities. There is state and federal funding that's available to improve infrastructure and support programming for walking and biking to school, but you can't access those funds unless you have a comprehensive plan in place. Um, the plan was developed, it was by, the for, by and for the partnership, but um, it was really great to be working together with um, school district staff on this plan because we just were able to gather a more robust set of data to inform the recommendations. We were able to take a look at how many student households are in each walk zone for each school site. Um, we were able to do some student travel tallies, so we had a baseline level of data about how kids are getting to school. Um, we were also able with our consultant to do site visits for our consultant to observe arrival and dismissal at each site. 
Uh, we did a lot of stakeholder input through the working group um, that was established, but also through interviewing each principal at each site. Um, we went and talked to the Edina High School Student Council, and we also conducted a parent survey, and all of that data is included in the full plan, which I um, recommend you take a look at. So recommendations were categorized by time frame. There are short, midterm, and long-term recommendations. And we tried to identify an implementation lead where it, it made sense. Um, but just knowing that you know, we want to continue to be talking together and working together on these things as much as we can. Um, you'll see the recommendations for the city, um, the short-term ones for the city. We've already made progress on bicycling on sidewalks. This came up with both parents and with the student council that um, kids knew it was illegal to ride on sidewalks. And they were troubled by it um, because that's where their parents told them to ride. So um, we wanted to address that. We also um, needed to address the crosswalk policy, which has also been addressed by the city now. Um, and that's really about consistent treatment of crosswalks, especially near school buildings. Um, and also taking a look at enforcement and school speed zones. We've been having some conversation with the police department already about um, how we can be more visible around in uh, back to school and in springtime. Uh, there were also some recommendations for a joint city and district to work on together. We'd like to continue working together in a working group. Um, there's lots of opportunities for coordination, I think, on, on, these, um, on these recommendations. The Transportation Commission has a walking and biking public education campaign on their work plan for this year. And this is really around, as we continue to improve infrastructure for all modes of travel in the city, we want to make sure that everyone knows what the rules are and what the responsibilities are, whether you're a motorist or a bicyclist or a pedestrian, and that we're developing a culture of respect, that we all respect each other's choices. Um, so we have some grant funding to work on that, and we'd love to work together with the district um, on developing that, and, and you guys have fabulous community communications channels, so. Um, and, then, uh, and then also we have started, the city staff apparently has already talked with the district around kind of preliminary discussions about how we can work together on Valley View Road with the exchanges at the high school. It's just always a perennial issue. Um, and then short-term recommendations for the district, what came up, um, improved bicycle par parking at the school. This was also brought up by the high school student council. Um, continue or initiate site level walking and biking activities, which have often been led by the PTAs, and there's been a lot of great successes there and just lots of enthusiasm. Creating a walking and biking section on the district website, designating a active routes to school coordinator or at least a part of someone's um, job to kind of serve as a point person for the city, public health, and others in coordination of resources. Um, incorporating walking and bicycling to school into the school wellness policy. Um, we had a lot of discussion about this because we felt like um, a policy can really make clear the responsibilities of parents, the responsibilities of students and of staff and help to mitigate potential liability concerns. And we consulted with the Public Health Law Center on that and got some good guidance and they are available as a support for district council to move forward with that if, they, if you choose. Um, Finally, to incorporate walking and biking safety into the phi ed curriculum. Walking and bicycling are lifelong physical activities, so as the opportunity arises to take a look at phi ed curriculum over the years, it would be great to consider including units or lessons on um, how, instructing kids on how to be safe pedestrians and bicyclists. And then long-term, mid-term and long-term recommendations are really about filling gaps in the infrastructure. And I'm delighted to tell you that a number of these sidewalk um, gaps that have been identified near school sites are programmed for construction in either 2014 or 2015. And the city will continue to make progress on these, um, especially after uh, city council is uh, scheduled to approve this plan, and hopefully they will tomorrow night. I'll be presenting there. Um, they've heard it once already in draft form. And, uh, and then also to continue e evaluating the effectiveness of school speed zones. And long term for the district, the recommendation was really just to take a look at improving school sites as opportunities arise. Um, in terms of next steps, um, obviously we're doing the, the presentation tonight to you all and um, we'll be hopefully adopting by the city council tomorrow night. We've gotten fabulous input from some of the city commissions. Um, and Val has done a tremendous job of taking pieces of this plan out and kind of funneling them off to the right people throughout the district. Um, so it's, that's been great. And in terms of implementation and next steps, we want to continue to identify opportunities to work together and monitor and apply for funding um, and then do additional community outreach. So that is my... Thank you. Questions? Um, I noticed we had narrow driveways. I wasn't sure what you 
Yeah, there, there is more detail I'm in the full plan on that, but essentially it's obviously there's going to be a balance between needing access for buses to get in and out of driveways, but it's taking a look at what's the kind of what's the, the minimum width that we need for the buses to have good access and emergency vehicles, obviously, but also taking a look at the longer the driveways are, it just presents a, a greater hazard for people crossing them. So it's really about the pedestrian access across. Um, so that's that's the nature of that one. There's no questions or yeah. comments? With the proposed sidewalks, what is the plan for maintaining them in the winter for plowing? The uh, so I think I believe that many of these are city maintained sidewalks. Um, there are probably a handful that are part of neighborhood reconstruction and when and when it's a road when when it's a roadway where um, it is, it's a local roadway, then neighbors are required to maintain them. Um, but more and more I've seen, and it, and it might be part of our living streets policy now that the city maintains sidewalks around schools. So I would have to, I, I should double check on that one and let you know, but um, that's something that as a transportation commission we've been talking about that we need to really see those sidewalks as, as transportation routes and make sure that they're cleared. Thanks. Yeah. For people who wanted to see the um, sidewalk uh, projects that are being contemplated, is there a place on the city website or someplace to go that m maps that all out like they do for street construction? That is an excellent question. Um, we <laughs> are currently, the city staff is currently developing a map of planned sidewalks like we have for street road reconstruction. And um, I believe that's gonna be heard by council a little bit later this summer, like maybe in July. So that should be on the city's website soon, but I can tell you that um, programmed for 2015, for construction tw in 2015 is Valley View Road, the south side of Valley View Road from Gleason to Antrim. So it's the opposite side of the road where the sidewalk is right now mm -hmm. at, at the high school. Okay. And then Interlock and Boulevard, there's preliminary planning for that one uh, for 2015. And then, um, let's see. Sun Road, Arbor Avenue, and Benton Avenue is planned as part of a 2015 neighborhood street reconstruction project. So as much as possible, the city will try to fill these in when there's a road reconstruction project because there's a greater efficiency of resources when they can do it all at the same time. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The uh, ordinance that allows bicyclists to be on the sidewalk, does that apply to every bicyclist or just students or people below a certain age? Yeah, we had some discussion about whether it should just be um, residents under the age of 18, but then we talked about how for many bicyclists in the city, myself included, there are places in the city where I would feel really uncomfortable riding in the road, like say in, on France Avenue in the Southdale District. And so we didn't want to limit it to just youth, but we did put some pretty clear restrictions on how fast you can ride on the sidewalk and how you need to... Um, announce yourself to pedestrians and make way for pedestrians. So that's gonna be hopefully part of this public education campaign that we're providing some guidance to people about how they need to comport themselves if they choose to ride on the sidewalk because there are risks to riding on the sidewalk. Are, are, are other communities doing this also? Most of the cities around us already allow bicycle riding and it's in Minnesota state statute. So to a certain degree it was kind of, you know, coming up modernizing our, our ordinance. There's no questions? Thanks, Val and Kathy. Thank you. Kathy, thank you. Val, thank you. We're under our birth to grade five uh, academic uh, program study. We'll introduce Gwen Jackson and Randy Smazel as two of the players that are working uh, on presenting this. The board did hear a presentation at the June 2nd meeting about this work. Uh, the district's been a very aggressive campaign around our strategic work on uh, programming. I know there's a variety of other players here to help support uh, Randy and Gwen in their sharing, and so I'll have them introduce them as they are, are speaking. But welcome, uh, Randy and Gwen. Good evening, Chair Meyer, Superintendent Dressen, and school board members. Um, my name is Randy Smosel, Director of Teaching and Learning. I'm joined by uh, Director of Human Resources, Gwen Jackson, by uh, Rick Sanstead, our elementary principal at Concord, 
uh, by Lisa Hawthorne, our coordinator of early childhood special ed, uh, Peter Hodney, our elementary principal at Highlands, and Karen Bergman, our elementary principal at Countryside. What we are going to present to you this evening is the summation of a great deal of work from this past school year, looking at where we want to go with uh, early childhood and elementary school programming. Okay. I'll try to escape out of this here. <laughs> so in, as we're waiting for this to load, in um, year one of this work, we've been focused on options development and exploration and later um, throughout the year have then created these recommendations which we would like to show you in just a few <laughs> minutes. <laughs> the design team that worked on this uh, includes our elementary principals that you see here and our other elementary principals. Um, also our school readiness uh, liaison, our coordinators for early childhood special ed and early childhood family ed, um, and also our district, several district office admin. So we're working in the background there, so we'll keep going. And then we'll pull those slides up in a second. We used, to do this study, we used a strategic design process. And in that strategic design process, we start with this stage of discovery where we really try to generate what are the questions that we want to explore. And the questions that we aim to explore really, re really revolve around what is what does the next generation of elementary and early childhood programming look like for Edina Public Schools? So we sought after uh, looking at the research, looking at other innovative school programs across the country, looking at um, schools that are doing some interesting things, and started making this huge list of some of the uh, factors that we want to consider as we look to this next generation of programming. We then took that information and started generating surveys. Um, we had face-to-face -face meetings with staff, with uh, students, with community members. We generated some focus groups. <laughs> so you're all good. And, uh, <laughs> and through, through that uh, process, we started to narrow down what are some of the ideas that we really want to investigate and that we really want to explore. Thank you so much. As we progress through the year, so we're now in this kind of this interpretation stage. As we progress through the year, we go in through this design process, we begin to narrow those ideas down and we generated some options. We took those options back to stakeholders. Uh, we have now refined those options and have generated really four recommendations that we'll be presenting to you this evening. So that was a visual display of the process. Now I'll take you kind of through a process, uh, a step-by-step -step, um, display of the process. So again, we, we've been researching these innovative programs and, and best practice strategies, and this has really been an ongoing process and continues um, uh, at this time. In December and January, we did a lot of brainstorming with students, staff, and parent surveys. The question that we really asked folks was, what should we continue doing in next generation of Edina program? And what should we start doing and what should we stop doing? And that's how we frame some of the brainstorming opportunities. In February and March then, out of that brainstorming came that option development, looking at what does program, what does structure, what does culture look like in the future? And then in March and April, really refining those ideas into draft options, taking them back out to the stakeholders and continuing to refine those options and cluster them into what we have now as a set of recommendations. Our plan moving forward is then to, upon approval of those recommendations through this process with board presentation, our plan is then to determine how do we implement this work. If we are defining the what and where we're going, now how do we get there? And that's the work of next year. In 15 and 16, potentially um, next generation pilots, figuring out what does phased in implementation need to look like depending upon how we're implementing and then continuing to refine the, um, the implementation until we are fully implemented with our recommendations and action plans. The parameters that guided this study in this process included, 
included enhancing achievement for all students, advancing learning through innovation technology and how we use time, maximizing the resources that we have as a district, which include our funds, our facilities, our talented staff, and um, look, trying to really define the direction for early childhood and for elementary programming, which also impacts the facilities that we need in the future to carry out that programming. So also informing our facilities planning and looking at our entire program as a pre-K-12 program, so making sure that the recommendations that were developed through the secondary study are also aligned to the recommendations that have been developed through the SPIRT, the grade five study. And you'll see some language in some of our recommendations that indicate some of that alignment. At this time, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Gwen Jackson. Thank you, Randy. Is this on? I can't tell if it doesn't. Okay, great. So, um, as Randy said, in March and April, we took it back out to the staff, the parents, and the community members to give us some feedback on uh, some components of structure. And the structure included talking about um, flexible spaces, looking at furniture um, differently. Some of our furniture hasn't been changed in many, many decades. And um, there are some new things out there uh, to better meet the needs of our students. We also asked for feedback about a flexible calendar. That is a, a huge issue among some of our families, especially our younger families with younger children and their schedule, schedules and the walkable routes to school, as we just heard a, a great presentation about them. Uh, we also asked for feedback from, from members about the program. And the program includes, should we have additional um, CP programs? Should we look at pre-K programs in some of our elementary schools and all of our elementary schools? Some thoughts about that, as well as additional language, uh, world language. There's always an interest in, uh, growing interest in additional world languages throughout our school district. We also asked for feedback about student leadership opportunities. There are some wonderful programs that some of our schools have been using to develop the leadership skills of our elementary students, especially our fourth and fifth graders, and how could we enhance that. Then we got feedback, uh, we got feedback on the from the board and from administration on some components of the, of the framework and um, we were encouraged to look at how we, were, um, how we were looking at global competence and what's a way to be more develop developmentally appropriate with that. We also asked to, uh, were asked to look at some research, for example, STEM, which is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, versus STEAM, which is science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. So we're going to continue doing some research on some of those components, as well as some other areas, um, is like the world language and what that should look like. With that, the next area was framing it into the four areas, as Randy has talked about. And there are four, we took all of this information that we had researched or got information from the community and put it into four strategic, uh, four strategies, which are gonna be described by Rick, Lisa, uh, Peter, and Karen. And I'll turn it over to Rick. All right, the, uh, the first one, really looking at, uh, so you see the term global competence, uh, but also looking at, uh, as we transition that to global awareness and understanding. Um, I don't know, I was, had a chance to catch a little bit of World Cup before I got over here. <laughs> um, and obviously the, the world is uh, connected to that at the moment, but uh, is how do we help uh, expose and enhance our learners um, to those uh, development of those global skills? How do those connect to the work of the secondary study? How do those connect back to the next generation profile of Edina learners um, or those educational competencies? Uh, and so uh, really how do some of those pieces connect? And in this area, really uh, Gwen had mentioned some world language. How does world language fit into this? Uh, and again, enhancing and exposing, uh, I think are, are two terms that uh, uh, provide us some, some opportunity there. How does technology fit in? Uh, making sure that uh, all of our students uh, um, from preschool to secondary school, uh, that they have diverse perspectives about the world, 
Again, Gwen touched on some student leadership opportunities, and then how to service learning. I think that's a key component as I've um, had a chance to watch kids both in the preschool experience, uh, my kids in preschool, and also at uh, Countryside is uh, really some great opportunities in service learning that I think are um, exposing and enhancing their, uh, their perspective related to uh, uh, global awareness and understanding. So um, the next area is enhanced um, and integrated curriculum, and we're looking really at our vision for our learners to use their academic skills and to learn within the context of real life situations. And so um, next year, some of our action steps looking around aligning curriculum um, for through grade five, um, implementing some of our core strategies, and um, looking real specifically at the developmental needs of each of our students, then highlighting some research around looking at um, viable additional choice programs for all of our learners and looking at advancing our e-learning squared technology initiative to include programming and then some coding and then eventually looking at STEM and STEAM programs like Gwen mentioned. Okay, I have the next slide. Um, wellness, uh, student wellness and engagement. We heard a little bit about wellness, thanks you, <laughs> that was great. Um, about the active routes to school. And you actually even saw some brain scans on there of kids after movement um, and you know how alert their brains are and how that lasts for a long time. So we're talking about not only things like the routes to school, but also what can we do in classrooms to have kids move more there. I know that we've done a lot of this in, in different buildings uh, to a degree. So we know it works. I mean, you can use cooperative structures like some of the Kagan structures that get kids up and moving. And we've done a little of this. We just need to notch it up like maybe four or five notches. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, uh, we, we know it works from research and from practice, but we just need to be more intentional about it. Um, and, and in addition to the learning benefits, there's obviously health benefits to movement. So uh, that's the wellness part. Engagement, uh, we also know about. I mean, anybody really kind of knows that if a student is not engaged, they're probably not learning that much. And so engagement's a big thing, and we understand that. And so now we're trying to figure out, like, how do you engage kids? Um, one of the things that we talk about is sparks and, like, really getting to know the child and relate to the child and, and have an understanding of the child and what do they like and how can you weave that into what you're teaching um, as part of it. Another part that we've been working with in the district is like some of the Shiraki Holly work on culture and do understand the child's cultural background and can you engage a child on that um, and, and make them feel a part of the class even if they have a different cultural background. And so that's important work that we're doing and we just need to turn that up a few notches also. So um, all, both these things, wellness and engagement, are, are things we're doing. We just need to be more intentional about both of them. Um, okay. Thank you. The last part of the framework that we want to talk about is um, is that innovative use of time, space, and talent. And this, for in some ways, becomes that thing that you can reach out and touch. It it's it becomes those things that support our worldview and the curriculum and engagement um, and wellness. So uh, one of the things that we talk about a lot is how do we support instruction anywhere, anytime. And when it comes down to it, our staff is one of those great, great uh, assets that we have and how can we support them so that we can personalize learning in a, a, to a greater extent. So some of the things that we've talked about is how do we, how do we continue to um, hire and maintain those, those fabulous teachers that we have and, and the staff members who support us. And then in addition to that, how do we continue their development so that they can continue to develop our kids in really good ways. So um, that brings into, into the question of how do we fund um, each of those positions. So in working with that, that piece and then also too, how can we take a look at staffing in a little bit different way? How can we find innovative models that really truly will allow our staff to do the very best things for kids in the classroom? So staff is one of those areas. In other words, our talents um, that we have as resources. Um, flexible learning spaces. Once we decide what we need those kids to learn, we need to be able to flex those places that we teach them and make that look different um, and, and allow it to look different if it needs to. So um, we're taking a look at what does the furniture look like? What kinds of spaces is it? Is it a, a traditional classroom? Is it 
um, bringing together of um, more of, of just that idea of instruction, maybe not just the physical space. So a lot of different ideas that we're going to be talking about. Um, and the last piece that goes along with it is something that, that our board and, and administration teachers have been talking about a lot this year, and that is, what is that schedule? What's that calendar look like? We need to be able to give teachers that ability to help us be innovative in how do we schedule the day and then how do we schedule that year. And again, it all goes back to that learning anywhere, anytime. So we'll use those resources to help us find that way to make it all work and to put all those pieces together. So in terms of uh, next steps through this process, as you're listening to these general recommendations, um, we will bring this uh, topic back to our school board uh, discussion in July for adoption of our report and maybe some additional uh, board decision making as needed. Implementation planning beginning next year, potentially some pilots beginning next year, depending upon our timeline, uh, but also in the year 1516, and then this ongoing refinement of our plan uh, based on feedback and what is working and what isn't working. Uh, so at this time, we'll turn it over to our board for questions for our design team here. Who wants to go first? I have one question. If you could just speak briefly to some of the programming options. There's references to additional language program, additional choice program. You reference STEM, STEAM. And when I hear that, I know we'll hear the models that have been familiar to the Adina community in the past. We may have a school dedicated to an immersion program. We have other schools that are, that have maybe a continuous progress and a traditional learning program in there. Are those the kinds of models that you are referencing here, or are there other ways to introduce the programs that we haven't seen in our district before? So I'll start and ask that others jump in. Um, so there's, there's many different ways we can look at specialty programs. We can look at, if you look at language, we can look at that as an immersion option. Um, if you look at some of these other types of programs like STEM or STEAM, that could be at a particular site, or it could be that that's truly integrated and embedded across curriculum in all of the sites. So moving forward, that will be one of our challenges to really research some of those different ways that those programs have been offered in other schools and look at what, what is the recommendation for how we want to go down that path and what that direction looks like for us. Anybody else? Um, could you talk a little bit about what you mean by things like integrated curriculum? Over six other programs. Does that make sense? Uh, one of the things we talk about with integrated um, curriculum is not just talking about like a reading time, but really incorporating reading with social studies or reading with science. Um, really integrating the class so that you might be doing math and science and language arts all at the same time, um, but the kids are learning in those particular areas. Some of that, we've done some good things around science and literacy, so social studies and literacy. Uh, how do we embed some of those nonfiction pieces into our curricular uh, areas? Uh, I believe I saw our sixth grade, uh, one of the sixth grade teams uh, next year as part of that. Uh, um, Secondary study was really looking at that uh, carefully. Uh, had, um, I know some of our staff had a chance to meet with some people from another West Metro district around what they're doing around integrated curriculum. So, and, and really, I think goes back to Peter's comment about Spark is how do we take that Spark and not have it just be about math or just be about science or just about reading, but how do we uh, take that whole piece of the puzzle and, and uh, create a high quality experience for kids uh, that uh, helps them grow. Yeah, I think that's important. I think um, there's a lot of integrated uh, curriculum in things like uh, IB programs. And so uh, sometimes I think we, we kind of make up these things like there's math and there's science. And, but really, in the real world, you're using those things together. And so I think the more that we can do that and the more that you can understand things by reading about them and maybe doing some science about it, and it, you know, just it, it makes more sense to the child and it's more real world. 
And, and that's, that's the kind of thinking they're going to need to solve some of the issues that they'll face in their lifetimes. Is it's just not isolated, siloed things. The other thing that you think of when you think of that integration of curriculum is not just within the subject matters, but the students who are learning and the students who are interacting within that. For instance, we are a B5 group, birth to grade five, and we talk, uh, talked a lot about what does it look like that transition for our preschoolers coming into a kindergarten setting and what are those key transition points and how can we create not only the structure but also the learning that they're going to be doing throughout. So I think thinking of it as a subject matter but also thinking of it as that transition and that consistency or continuity for all of our students coming up and through would be, would be another way to, to just keep that in mind. I think we do a really nice job already in early childhood integrating our curriculum around thematic units and embedding it into the routine of everyday tasks. And our challenge with integrating birth to, to five-year-old curriculum into an elementary is to align our curriculum. And so that takes place um, looking at those developmental skills. What does each learner know? And, and how do we transition those skills within that kind of systematic approach to kindergarten? And I think we can take a behavioral response and say that when kids see the connections between different content and different concepts, it's more engaging, it's more relevant, and thus it's more motivational for them as a learner. Or we can take the, the neuroscience perspective and say that when those um, similar experiences are being connected in the brain, then we have a better brain development, better brain connection, better neural pathway development, and those students have a better chance of retaining and holding on to those concepts for a longer time. So whether it's through motivation or brain development, integrating curriculum ends in, a, in this result of better and longer term learning for kids. In, in your research on this, um, did you actually see examples in other buildings of the incorporating more physical movement into the day, outside of, you know, just during recess, the gym a couple times a week? What other examples did you see that allowed kids to get that movement in? I think it goes, so personally, I think what Peter mentioned earlier is true. We see that, and I, and actually the kids' feedback as we, if you walk around the building or um, whatever building you happen to be in that day, you can see where that movement and that, um, that piece is, is helpful as kids are going through their day. I know we had a chance uh, to visit uh, Health and Science Magnet um, out in the east suburbs. Um, I can't remember exactly, Moreland. Um, and also, and they're working closely with Mayo Clinic, and how are they, again, I think, and again, Peter touched on this, is really being intentional and purposeful. Um, Go Noodle is, uh, if you've got kids in elementary school, you may have heard of that, and I know at Countryside and Concord, uh, my two closest, ex closest experiences, I know that's a part of, uh, how do we get a gauge movement, and, um, and that's part of through our health, our health curriculum, um, how do we engage kids in that way, and, and again, I think the, the child response as you walk around the buildings uh, related to movement is, is pretty apparent. That And then, again, I, I echo what Peter said, in, intentional, purposeful, you know, let's be really planful about it. I think if uh, anyone questioned that, they just had to be around uh, some of the elementary schools after all those uh, snow cold days when we couldn't go outside they and what it. the kids were <laughs> like. Yeah. Because um, they need to move. And mm -hmm. I think there, there are a number of ways. There are things like go noodle, there's brain gym that are purposeful, stop your class and do this for a minute or two. And then there's things that you can do with cooperative structures that move kids around that are really just part of the lesson. And I think we need to tap into both of those um, in addition to how kids get to school and you know keeping our FIAD, the movement in there. But you know, FIAD's a couple times a week, so we need to find out like every day how do you do this um, through intentional you know, brain gym, go noodle activities or things that they're just part of a cooperative lesson where kids move, so. Additional questions? Excellent, thank you for your work. Thank you, everybody. Next up, we have our leadership update, Dr. Dressen. I'm gonna ask uh, Randy to uh, start us off here um, as we have a variety of topics, uh, some short slide shows, uh, PowerPoint presentations on a variety of topics that <laughs> as we're winding down the 2013-14 year, um, just that we want to touch base with the board on and uh, also identify some action items uh, will be occurring later in the board meeting. 
We also are uh, excited about the strategic plan coming forward with the special education study. And so uh, we've got uh, a lot of variety of topics that we'll ask uh, Randy to kick us off and then we'll just kind of move us through the, the model as it goes. And I'll ask uh, Libby Sandvik, our Altcom facilitator, and Rana Jonas Gear, uh, Altcom instructional coach, to join me up here as we uh, just give you a brief summary of some of the activities from Altcom this year. Uh, this is the sixth year of Altcom. Uh, this year was a continuation of a, a very successful program, and I say very successful based on the feedback from teachers and how they describe it impacts. Um, their instruction in the classroom and their impact with students. Uh, you'll see it as a consent item to accept the Alt-Comp annual report, which needs to be submitted to uh, Minnesota Department of Education by June 30th of this year. Um, some of the impacts or summaries that you'll see in that report, including teachers feeling less isolated as a result of this program, uh, more open to sharing uh, between teachers and uh, open to uh, observations of other adult professionals in their classrooms, and in summary, basically creating a culture of self-reflection across the school district. And so at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Libby Sandvik uh, to give us some highlights on our program. All right, so one of the strengths of our program is the cognitive coaching model that our coaches use with teachers. And that is where the coaches are helping guide teachers through a reflective conversation on their teaching practice, both after observations and in the goal writing process. Um, another strength is we had seven coaches this year who were able to implement this program with fidelity across the district. And that includes the observations that were done of teachers, goal setting meetings, and additional meetings following up on um, some of their goal setting. The coaches had over 4,700 meetings with teachers over the course of the year. And that was pre-observations, observations, posts, and then meetings surrounding goals. What we saw this year is just a continuation of the trend of teachers taking more risks, inviting coaches in to observe more challenging situations. Excuse me. Um, and writing increasingly rigorous student learning goals. This year, 97% of our teachers implemented their goals and earned their incentive based upon implementation. The coaching team has remained strong in part due to the professional development we've engaged in this year. As in years past, the coaches meet every week uh, for a two-hour meeting that includes some professional development and then all of our coaches engaged in a variety of professional development training opportunities throughout the year including some sessions on engagement, uh, culturally responsive teaching, and PLCs. And now to speak to some of the examples of the ways our coaching has impacted teachers in the classroom, I'll pass this on to Rhonda. Hi, um, I, there are many different examples. I'll just give you a couple of them tonight. Uh, one of them that I'm thinking of is a teacher who's a veteran teacher, um, has taught in a couple of different districts 20 plus years. And um, when I met with her for one of her observations, uh, or for the pre-observation, um, she talked about a group of students that she was working with in this particular class who had a lot of unique characteristics and she was um, being challenged by how to ex exactly meet all of their needs. And so uh, through our pre-observation uh, meeting, I just asked her different questions about what made them challenging, what was particularly um, standing in the way of their learning, that kind of thing. And um, sh after the meeting, she sent me an email and said, thank you for the pre-observation. I um, redid what I was planning to do for my or for the lesson as a result of our pre-observation conference. And then she asked me to collect some real specific data while I was observing her. And then in the post, um, we again talked about some of the changes she had made based on the pre-observation. And then um, because of the data that I was able to collect, she then, um, it was another set of eyes in the classroom, things that she kind of was thinking and wasn't quite sure about. And because I was able to look at it from another perspective or an outside perspective, it helped her solidify some of the things she was wondering about and then was able to make some changes as a result of that. Um, so that's one example. Another one I'm thinking of is um, a teacher that I worked with 
on her student learning goal, she had um, a couple of different ideas about what she wanted to do, but wasn't exactly sure how to make them into a student learning goal. And so I asked her some different questions about, you know, where do you think that these students are really struggling? What do you think would help them the most? And what she ended up landing on is that she really wanted to write a goal that had something to do with all of her students um, achieving a C minus or higher in her class. And so we came up with some different interventions that she could do and um, things that she could help the, the students with. And then as I would meet with her and drop in just periodically and check um, on how things were going, we would tweak the goal and she'd make adjustments. And by the end of the year, all of her students in that those classes that she was targeting did in fact achieve a C minus or higher and um, she did some real targeted interventions with them and um, just really kept them close to her in terms of what her following up with them and that kind of thing. And so um, as a result of kind of our continued, continued really um, specific conversations throughout the year, she was able to, uh, her students were able to achieve that goal. And with this presentation tonight, our AltComp program, as we know it, kind of is coming to a close because tomorrow morning we're going to jumpstart teacher evaluation um, because that AltComp will be incorporated into our program beginning next year. So tomorrow morning, um, coaches and administrators will be engaged in a four-hour training um, to really start our teacher evaluation program, looking at the plan itself and digging into both the teacher and the non-classroom teacher rubrics. We have eight coaches on board, four are returning coaches from AltComp, and we have four new coaches to the team. We are going to move into some differentiated teacher training in the August back to school workshop week. We are going to incorporate a new software data management system that we are getting up and running this summer and that will help track teachers observations and their evaluations over the course of their three year cycle. The rubric and teacher work will really be a three year process rather than kind of the one year standalone process we've had with AltComp and that's where a lot of the training will be focused over these next few months. AltComp incentives will remain the same as long as funding from the state continues, um, but AltComp will be incorporated into teacher evaluation from this point forward. So, I would just like to publicly thank Libby for all of her work in this transition to this new teacher evaluation model. Many, 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 many hours put forth trying to figure out how to make that shift. Our, thank our coaches and the work that they have done this year with staff, trying to move staff uh, toward their goals and support them in the work. And also our, just thanking Rob uh, Gardner for all of his work in helping us figure out how to put this MOU together so we meet the state statute and requirement, but it also drives our system forward to a, a new and better teacher evaluation system that we really hadn't looked at in quite a few years. So the opportunity was there with the statute change and uh, we are excited about the direction we're headed and at this time we'll just stop and see if the board has any questions. Questions? Very well done. Thank you for the work. Yeah. Thank I, you. I echo Randy's admiration for the hours it took to do the the transitions thank you and I love the examples of the work you're doing with the teachers and it's just that we all need improvement at all times and I just think the way you guys are doing it it's great so thank you for sharing thank you next up we're moving to uh, preliminary budget Good evening. We started this process in December at Finance and Facilities Committee, committee meeting, uh, preparing for 14-15 budget, and here we are uh, after several months' worth of um, progress uh, on the budget and presenting the official preliminary budget to you. Thank you for your work as a board and to the staff and community for um, all the work over the last several months. Um, 
this presentation is a summary, and some of it you as the board are very familiar with because it is part of our budget process that we have gone through, but uh, I do have slides in here just for the public reference. I'll, I'll fly pretty quickly through them. Um, also, in your board materials, and we will post it on our website uh, after this evening, is the official budget document that includes narr narrative and graphical and then more detailed financial information. Again, I won't go through all of that in detail tonight um, because I'm sure you want to get home this evening, um, but we will go through it in summary format. Um, we do have our budgets based on students, and so this chart shows the average daily membership uh, for our students. Uh, we're slow and steady, uh, growing or about stable. We did recently receive the um, demographic report from Hazel Reinhardt on resident students. This chart includes how we budget. It also includes our open enrollment students and calculated as an average daily membership and how the state funds us for those students. Our budget assumptions, just to review, uh, one of the major changes there, or a change there since uh, we started our budget planning process uh, several months ago was an additional $25 per pupil unit on the formula. Um, we also had significant legislative changes in the funding formulas in the legislative session in 2013. All those are incorporated, um, one of those being the uh, change of all day, every day kindergarten to the general fund. So you'll see changes there on the expenditure side and the revenue side. You'll see those in the general fund. And you'll also see uh, the change out of the community services fund because that's where the program um, historically has been funded out of uh, that extra half a day. Um, we also had some part of the budget plan had some one-time enhancements, ongoing enhancements. Some of those had a revenue impact, some had an expenditure impact, and so you'll see those changes in the assumptions ongoing. Um, we can go on through the adjustments. Did you want to add anything there? This was a process, again, that was separate from the budget process, but was always part of the whole, and the board did uh, take action on these. Uh, at the May board meeting, which then allowed us to move forward with our planning efforts. Um, and you can see how the totals rolled forward with a blend of using um, uh, realignment of our funding so that uh, we could make sure that we have some of our funding going to some of our more strategic areas. And then also you accessing our fund balance on some one-time enhancements that again allows us to jumpstart some of our strategic work. If you look at that preliminary uh, budget document, the more detailed one that's in your board packet, there's four different sections. Um, for the quick narrative, executive summary of what happened, what went up, what went down from the previous year, what were the major assumptions, that's a really good place to go. Um, then there's a, a section with our budgeting policies and our strategic plan. The financial section that gets a little bit more detailed, nice place to gather uh, four years of history along with the budget and see some changes, um, but yet not, not uh, as detailed as what's in the information section where you can go there and um, see revenues and expenditures in a variety of uh, reporting formats and different sorts to make comparisons uh, over a five-year period. Also, just a reference note, page 28 includes um, definitions for some of the terminology that we use uh, in terms of program definitions, and that'll help you also um, if you're not sure what's included in something um, for some of the charts. And then uh, in terms of fund balance impact, page 14 and 15 are nice one-page summaries on what's happening in the various funds and the impact to fund balance. Ultimately, we are performing uh, better than um, uh, projected slightly, which is a good position to be in. Some of that is that increase, $25 increase in the funding formula. We, as uh, later in the agenda, I'll report that workers' compensation premiums are coming in very favorable. Health insurance came in just slightly better than we thought that it would. And so a combination of a variety of things and um, we're positioned just a little bit better than we thought we were gonna be. Here's a chart on our revenue history by fund. Um, you can see the building fund uh, that is dependent upon what projects we have. And you can slightly see in the community service and you'll see it on the expenditure side, uh, reduction in revenue and expense. And that directly correlates to the all day, every day kindergarten change. Debt service, I'll just point out this one. Uh, the higher 
a bar there. That's a, when we did the crossover refunding or refinancing of our debt service. There's some specific accounting mandates on how you have to account for the dollars put in escrow until you actually do refinance it. So from a comparison standpoint, uh, sometimes that can just be a very unusual looking chart, but there, mm -hmm. there is a good reason why it is that way. Uh, general fund revenue history, uh, the majority of our funding comes from state aid, just about 70 percent and about 27 percent local levy. Um, then this is a chart, we, uh, actually we just received um, the, the beginning of June from the State Department. I thought it was um, uh, useful in terms of comparing revenue, state aid, and levy with CPI since 2003. And typically I have a chart in here um, that I create that can kind of compares the revenue formula against um, inflationary indexes. And this one just basically that bottom green dotted line shows uh, since 2003 that districts throughout the state have increased their reliance on the local levy operating referendums. Um, and the reason for that has been, if you look at that middle line, that red dotted line, is that state funding has been relatively flat. And if you notice, um, now in 2015 is actually the first time it has gone higher at $9,269 than it was in 2003 at $9,111. So just an interesting piece of data I thought I would add in there. Uh, general fund expenditure history broken out by uh, various areas of where we spend our dollars. Didn't speak too much. Uh, general fund again for this particular year. The other was uh, the other charts were a five-year history. This is for the 14-15 budget, and again, the majority of our funding of our funding comes from the state. Um, uh, we are a service-oriented business, and we spend about 83 percent of our budget on um, staff providing that service. Another way of looking at our expenditures, oh, then going deeper into uh, salaries and benefits then by uh, various staff groupings uh, where we spend our dollars. And then the next one is um, by program area. These are the ones where the definitions are on page 28. I'm happy to report we spend about just under 80% of our budget on instruction or instructional support services for our students. This is a, uh, also from MDE information. It's from 2012-13, which is the most recent information the state, would, audited information the state would have on all districts. So I did a comparison of the Lake Conference districts and the average of those districts uh, across per student or ADM in the various program categories that districts report to the state. And there could be a variety of reasons why a district may be higher or lower in a particular area, but it's a benchmark and sometimes it, it can cause us to say, hmm, why are we lower there or higher there? There may be specific reasons. We may have a specific initiative. For example, in regular instruction, a lot of times you'll see variances between districts there with districts that have high free and reduced lunch counts because of the funding, federal and state, that goes into um, comes into the district for that gets coded to regular instruction. So that would be just one example. Another um, thing I would point out is the total general fund operating expense is we are very close to average just in that total. Um, the other thing I would point out is the debt service you see is higher is that that's because of 12-13 um, is the year that refinancing. We saw that chart earlier with that spike. That will change after we get that off that data. And then the long-term debt, we have um, lower than average debt compared to our comparison is districts. It, is, that a, is that a typo? <laughs> uh, <coughs> we're at 786 and everybody else at 12,000, I don't believe so, but I will double check that. You know what could be in there too is if other districts are refinancing or if they've, um, we are lower than others, but I will double check to make sure that's not a typo. It does seem like a significant difference. <laughs> <laughs> Looks favorable for us, but <laughs> I will double check it. Thanks. Uh, next steps are to review or continue to monitor legislative changes. There wasn't, there were not very many this year, but like I said earlier, the 2013 session did have a lot of changes for 14, 15, and we can 
continue to um, make sure that they're implemented correctly and stay on top of those. Update the long range financial plan. Um, get information into the state over the summer for levy certification. Preliminary levies is September in September. Audit report in October. Final levy in December and final budget approval in December. That's kind of a quick overview. The board will be acting later on this evening on the, the full budget. Uh, it did get reviewed by the Finance and Facility Committee of the board and um, would be open to any questions at this time. I just want to say thank you, Margo. I mean, there's a ton of work here. There's a lot of money you got to keep track of, and you're doing a great job with that. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank you to the business office staff. Um, yes, they do a lot of staff. detailed work for this. Yeah, um, it, it's a team effort. Thank you, Thanks, Margo. Margo. Yeah, well deserved. As we do our strategic planning, uh, what we've also been doing is uh, updating some of our specific program areas. Uh, earlier this year, uh, we did get, receive a report from the technology department on how we had revised uh, our district technology and media services. Um, tonight, I'm asking Penny Codridge to give us a flyover, as it were, of a strategic work we did in special education, the plan that was completed in May or April. And um, thank you, Penny, for being here tonight. Okay, good evening to you. Um, I'm here to present to you the next uh, strat strategic steps that need to take place as a result of this study. And as Rick said, it occurred um, late this winter, early spring. Um, it was really completed because we wanted to take a real fresh look at our programs and services, and we want to move the program forward. It also fit with the MDE compliance uh, schedule. We are in a five-year schedule in which we do a self-review, and part of that is reviewing our programs, and so it just really fit in into the context. Um, Special education is very broad in terms of programs and services. You can have children that are receiving programs and services all day to uh, consultation services. So it was not practical to cover all aspects of special education, so we needed to focus. And what we focused on is really where the majority of the students receive their services in special education lingo that's level one and level two, which means they really do receive most of their um, instruction in core curriculum and content areas, but then may be uh, receiving specialized instruction and services based on their IEPs and their program needs. So what came forward out of this were uh, steps that will require further study and will move into a process of refinement and recommendations. So that um, given that special education is specialized instruction, um, it may be helpful to give you some context um, data because uh, we have to think about how it aligns with general education and is integrated into the curriculum. And so just to share with you that in Edina schools, based on the latest child count, we serve um, about 10.3% of the total enrollment. Now this has been a steady uh, decline of services from our all-time high. Um, in addition to that, we serve um, based on primary disabilities. And we have, um, we take a look at that because of the trend lines. And we have over 13 primary disabilities that we um, consider not all disability areas are counted for in this district, but we're always looking at where are the predominant services needed. Uh, the predominant one is speech language. Um, the next is with the autism spectrum disorders. The other is the other health impairment, which can be medical needs as well as neurobiological disorders. And then we move into the specific learning disabilities. And there um, on forward have other disability areas that are not as uh, frequent, but they do require intensive services. We've had in terms of trends, um, about 130% growth in autism. That is not unique to Edina. That's true in the region and nationally. Uh, a 60% growth in other health impairment due to the medical needs of children. Um, we doubled in our growth in deaf, hard of hearing. Um, grew in our severely multiply impaired population and DCD severe profound. There was a 50% decrease in specific learning disabilities, which is really looking at math reading and written language. Special education, in order to qualify, you have to provide, uh, uh, 
have a profile that shows you have significant educational need. We think the decrease may be in part uh, due to the impact of RTI and early interventions because it's kind of based on a fail-based system and with early interventions we are capturing students before they refer to special education. So what that means is that there is a shift in student population. Though that we have decreases uh, in numbers, we have more complex disabilities and um, more complex needs. So in terms of looking at our challenges, we, we really, one of them is our revenue sources. Um, thank you, Margo, for just talking about, about that. But we really try to be very creative in terms of how we leverage uh, the reimbursements and the federal funds to our advantage. We are also really pursuing third-party billing um, and we try to make sure that we're capturing all the tuition for the excess costs with our open enrolled students. But in spite of that, special education is expensive and it does cost the district quite a bit of money in order to provide these services. And our focus then, as I had stated earlier, is because we have a continuum of services, was to really look at that 67% of the special ed students who are educated in level one and level two. Again, they are educated primarily in core curriculum areas. So the structure of the study itself was we did have a partnership with TeamWorks where they helped with the facility of the uh, study. The study team consisted of 20 uh, special educators that really represented a broad range of disability areas and years of experience. We had general ed teachers and general ed um, administration. We had five half-day meetings over two months with work that was done in between those uh, meetings. We conducted an environmental scan, which looked at key trends, and we developed a vision, and some key steps to the vision, developed key initiatives, which I'm gonna share with you, have action cards and a scorecard. So a lot of work was done during that time. In terms of major challenges, uh, federal and state laws and regulations are constantly evolving and it does place limits on our educational uh, decisions. We have to make sure we're in compliance, but at the same time, too, we really want to be responsive to the educational needs, be aligned with general education, and certainly uh, we want to align with the major studies that are taking place. We do n there is not a vision whatsoever of any kind of isolation or working in silo. It's about integration, but it can be challenging given some of the federal state laws and regulations. Of course, we talked about limited resources. We have changes and shifts in our student population. Uh, facility options um, are expanding given our needs and expectations. Uh, we do have more medically fragile uh, children, so we have to provide more medical treatments. We have to utilize more high-tech equipment. There's motor equipment. And then for some of the uh, students that have self-regulation difficulties, we need to have spaces for them to modulate their um, their behaviors and to help them to be able to get back into the classroom. So all those factors come into the space um, uh, challenges that we have. We do have an achievement gap between the white student population and special ed student population, though I have to say on whole, our special education students perform really well on the MCA tests, especially in reading, but we do have a gap and it needs to be addressed. And we certainly want to be in alignment with the studies, all for all facility, B5 secondary. The other thing is, of course, we, we have the MDE SIMP process and we continue to have to be in, uh, consider their review. So in terms of the vision, the vision really leads into the four key strategic um, initiatives that are an outcome that could, do need to be uh, worked on in the future. But it's a, it's a vision of alignment, it's a vision of integration a vision of really clear department structure, roles, responsibilities, uh, a service delivery model that is uh, consistent and equitable across sites. We want to really take a better and closer look at the whole student in terms of their wellness because of various issues related to mental health. Um, we want to make sure that with the changing student that there are shared student expectations between family and school. And of course, we want to make sure curriculum and facilities are aligned. So the four key uh, strategic initiatives, essentially in terms of the first one, it's to be really clear on clear, clear ownership that 
um, special education students are the responsibility of all. When you have um, different administration, whether it's the district office or at site, you want to make sure when you have choice programs or you have special education programs in some of the schools and not in some of the other buildings that we are really aligned across the board in terms of that structure. Um, we need to look more carefully at, at our student, um, current student workload. With the changing student and parent expectations, sometimes this impacts staff capacity and can lead to service delivery inconsistencies. MDE is recognizing that. They themselves are coming forward. The task force has worked to create recommendations in terms of workload. I know that with this strategic step, that will be incorporated into the study. Um, we want to be able to continue to strengthen our PLC work because for staff, their report is that it really helps them in terms of their work and helps them to feel that they are improving in their services for students. The second one was to really redesign the relational approach. Now you say, well, in special education, do you not have a, a relational approach? Absolutely. But what this is really getting at is that um, we want to focus increasingly on student wellness. It also has to do with the fact that we want to do a needs assessment to see what really are the emotional, social, behavioral curriculum and what do we need to be implementing across the sites. It also talks about things where at the elementary level, for example, you have case managers that work closely with a student and family for many years. It's the same person looping through the years. However, at the middle and the high school, because it's so content oriented, we have to be so knowledgeable in content, we have been changing case managers from year to year because the teams focus, let's say, on the seventh grade content or a team might focus on the 10th grade content. We're looking at can we possibly loop because it can be at the expense of a relationship with a family or with a student. So our alignment, obviously, with a secondary study becomes really important as we look at that. So those are some exa examples. The third one has to do with our space and our resources. Um, really specifically, when you think about the types of students we're serving, where a student in the past, let's say, may go on homebound for a lengthy period of time, we have children now that might go into homebound services and loop back into the general curriculum. So being really creative in terms of how we can provide remote services for homebound students and use technology to be able to continue to give them the content so that they can have uninterrupted education experiences. And we need to be aligned with the facility study because if we're going to strive towards 21st century uh, spaces, we need to be aligned in terms of our work. Our space requirements are clearly changing based on the changing need of the students. And then the last one has to do specifically to our resource models. And we are looking at um, a study that will um, look at the, do a gap analysis of how our students are performing, uh, look at our look at best practices. Some of that work has already begun to see what other districts are doing. And this is going to really require a lot of parent input. It's going to require the structure of decision-making process. And so we are hoping and moving that forward to say that possibly in a couple years from now we might have a different service delivery model for this particular population. So there's more work to be done. It was really an exciting um, study. There are people that were in the room here earlier that were part of the study. The person to my right was involved with it as we had moved it along. Um, our next steps are really to, to design, uh, create design teams for each direction. We're going to utilize frameworks to guide our decision making and guiding change work. Uh, I should mention that the design teams will include parents in order to get their input, that we recognize how important that is. Um, we have action steps created, but we need to finalize the who for implementation, and we want to study more deeply uh, intensive service delivery models, which do exist for those students who persistently underachieve academically and behaviorally. So n any questions, any comments? Go ahead. Nice, very nice study. Um, impressive how tell me a little bit I really liked hearing that you were going to have the parents involved in some of your work how how will you 
access the parents uh, through actual, you know, work in the building? I mean, in terms of watching what's going on or surveys or how well, we engage? Sur surveys are going to be really important. That's going to be key to the process in terms of getting uh, the parent input in general. We also do have a parent advisory council. They will be part of the process. Um, the last meeting we had talked about the fact that they would be part of the process and decision making. And as we have done historically in this district, really trying to involve parent engagement, taking possibly I would envision some forms where parents could participate in that respect. So it needs to be designed exactly how we're going to do that, but I have confidence we will do that. Thanks. And the, the timing, so you'll have your design teams working next um, school year, and then is it, is it the intention that sometime during next school year we'll have some recommendations coming back to the board, or, or is that going to even be pushed out another year? I think the design teams and some of these studies can't and will be begin to be developed even this summer as we move into the fall. Some of that work is already in motion. And then, yes, there will be recommendations if it has major impact coming back to the board. I would anticipate, and Rick is going to be able to have to chime in here, but probably in a year from now in terms of some of those recommendations, particularly if it has impact on program service delivery changes. And we're looking at possible implementation in 2016, which is going to mean staff development work prior to that as well. I would concur with that, and it's similar. It, again, it's a phased-in process. It's what we have capacity to take on. You know, we have a new special ed or support services director jumping on board. We'll work with Penny and uh, work with other leadership in the district to uh, bring this all to life. But I think again, we're going to be able to see some work happening this summer. But the majority of the implementation work will probably be uh, in the 15-16 um, school year. And are we, we're going to be, I would assume, as intentional as possible in making sure that this framework. Um, dovetails with our birth through grade yep. five and our um, secondary studies. So, so everything we do with the, these uh, these type of studies is they do have to run through a filter that talks to our major study, so that it's, everything's in alignment. Okay, thank you. Uh, Penny, remind me how 287 students tie into your numbers. Are they viewed as our students, or are they? Is that a separate uh, pool of students? That's a good question, Randy. Um, what we have in terms of the numbers you have before though, you are the numbers of students we actually serve in the district. That is a different number in terms of the Edina residents that receive services. And that is a, an important distinction. And so Edina students that are in 287 programs are not included in those that we actually serve. That's two distinct ways we track students. Thank you. So likewise, some of the number that numbers that are quoted in the report that you give, just gave may include students who do not attend Edina Public Schools full time, but are non-public schools within Edina serviced by our special education services. That department. is correct. So Likewise, we have, we, we provide services to the non-public students. They may or may not be Edina residents, but because we provide services or even open enrolled students, we provide services to them. We include them when we talk about the numbers of students that we actually serve. I, I guess I was thinking also another direction, though, students who are within the Edina School District boundaries and attend a non-public school and qualify for services that are not provided at that school. Would there also be some students in that? Yes, count? there would okay. be. Thank you, Penny. Yeah, Thanks, thank Penny. You for your work. Annually, the board is uh, to receive an update on our student wellness program. We have a committee that's been working on that. Uh, Randy Smazel and Margo Bach are very active in uh, doing that work. It aligns with our wellness policy. Um, and again, I think we'll uh, let you know a little bit about uh, the involvement we've had. One of the big things we had was the wellness challenge that Randy helped sponsor um, earlier this spring. And maybe, Randy, you can just touch on that. and. Walk us through these slides. Sure. Uh, we had an exciting event back in April, about 230 uh, student participants. Um, to set up this event, we had some high school students that led challenges, physical activity challenges, over at Southview Middle School. About nine student leaders were partnered with uh, community mentors. And so they had an opportunity to kind of build that relationship, a design an activity that younger students would be challenged by. So the, 
the whole theme of this event was that you can manage your brain minute by minute through physical activity and exercise because when you are exercising, you're changing the blood flow, you're inc increasing glucose and oxygen, you're priming the brain for learning. You're producing chemistry that helps that brain learn at high levels. And those chemicals help memory, they help retention, uh, they literally help kids stay focused in school. So it was about some of those lessons around that. Uh, over 50 students completed a survey and 100% of the student, students said that the event was awesome <laughs> and they would like to participate in it again. So we were very excited to have Dr. John Raddy come and be a guest speaker at the event and uh, felt like our first, um, first of hopefully future uh, student wellness challenges was, was a success. Another component of the whole student wellness piece is our food service. Uh, system and uh, Margo leads the way with that. The board took action earlier this year and maybe Margo just touch base on that if you could. Good evening again. Yeah, as you're familiar we did go through a food service management uh, bid process and um, that was on a recent agenda item and so we ha did approve in that process to have Chartwells as a food service management company uh, starting July 1. Um, a committee developed the criteria and went through a rigorous process and, and came up with that recommendation. I'm pleased to report that we're moving along in that transition. Um, the Chartwell's <coughs> district management and upper management have ha developed a plan for transition. Sodexo staff is working with us in the transition. And uh, the most recent uh, development is that we do have a Chartwell's director of food service named as of this week. His name is Daniel Hutchinson. And he's recently re relocated to Minnesota. Um, he's from Il the Illinois area, worked in K-12 schools, and uh, relocated to Minnesota to be closer to grandchildren that attend Countryside School. Ah. Hmm. So look at that. Another piece was around the whole nutrition education, and we've got a couple programs going on where, we're, again, we're trying to do more around that uh, whole wellness piece of students, so it's nutrition, um, and monitoring a lot of the fed federal regulations along the way, but uh, a very complete uh, wellness program. Uh, we've got some other initiatives that we're rolling out uh, for next year. We're again also taking a look just at how we staff and support uh, some of our student wellness initiatives. And so as we look at our staffing models for 15-16 uh, going forward, we're going to continue to uh, have that uh, have an important part of our strategic work. I do want to uh, pause uh, and take a look back one more last time before we head into the new school year um, and talk about some of the successes we're experiencing as part of our strategic plan uh, annually in August the board does approve the uh, action plan for the year um, and there's just a lot on our strategic work and I want to thank uh, everybody who's involved with that uh, we've got a lot of those players who are sitting at the, this meeting tonight but it's also it's community members it's uh, parents it's, sta it's staff it's uh, students all involved in this but we worked hard around advancing personalized learning uh, everything from uh, moving forward with the power standards plan which uh, is uh, action that's taking on tonight, uh, advancing our all for all, all of us working for all learners, and we're entering year two of that. The board earlier this uh, year approved the e-learning square initiative. This is our bring your own device, the one-to-one -one, uh, technology initiative. We've defined personalized learning, which will be part of the agenda tonight, the wellness program. Uh, we uh, address that in creating this seamless system, uh, birth through uh, uh, age 85. Um, we've done our study work done some work on funding. Uh, again, we advanced all our major initiatives with our safety and security plan. Uh, we're working with Wold Architects now in our facilities. Uh, as it looks to partnerships, we've uh, been uh, advocating uh, some stronger partnerships with through community groups to support our families and making sure they have opportunities <coughs> and access to programming. You heard tonight about the teacher evaluation model that is moving into full gear as early as tomorrow morning. Uh, we've also grown our national partnerships and next uh, fall we'll be hosting the 21st Century uh, Consortium. It's the consortium of seven school districts throughout the United States that we partner and benchmark against. We continue to grow our community equity partnership work and advancing the work of professional learning communities or PLCs which will continue to be a cornerstone of all our work. So we're very pleased with the progress that's been made. The board will receive a full report 
in at the july meeting as an informational piece and then we'll start shaping our major initiatives which are presented at last month to gear is for the fourteen fifteen years we enter the third year of our strategic plan but i'll take a pause on that and see if there are questions around the work that we did this year in our strategic work questions a lot going on we do it's a good thing <laughs> a lot still to be done that is a, there's reason to get up tomorrow morning thank you thank you Rick. next up we have our uh, consent agenda we had a motion to, uh, to bring that to the floor so moved second been moved and seconded. Uh, Rick, could you please walk us through the consent agenda? I will. Um, we have our personnel recommendations. Um, and uh, among those recommendations tonight, we're pleased to be recommending uh, some leadership positions. Lisa Masika. Lisa is in the audience tonight. Lisa is going to be recommended as the new principal at Cornelia Elementary. Lisa has been an assistant principal in Eden Prairie. I've been very active in the community, former teacher for part of Edina Schools, and welcome her back. She's been uh, already involved in uh, some uh, meetings, both at a principal level and as well as doing some data work. And so we're very excited to have Lisa joining us, and she'll be back in action again tomorrow. So even though it's not July 1, we appreciate Lisa's involvement and welcome her to our team. And she's been part of our district equity advisory she's council. She's been part of a, a variety of uh, venues. So welcome, Lisa. It's great to have you on board. Uh, Jeff Jorgensen. Or Jeff Jorgensen is uh, the new director of support services. Jeff is uh, currently uh, at South Washington County, serving in that same capacity. Jeff will be joining the team as well tomorrow and doing some beginning his training. We welcome him to the team. And we are still uh, in the process of uh, identifying a couple other leadership positions but the board will see a variety of positions that we are approving tonight there is one uh, termination non-renewal that we're taking action on that's due to a licensure issue you can see expenditures that uh, we're taking a look at the alternative compensation annual report we heard about that earlier tonight there are two uh, policies and some actions we need to take one policy is on the health and safety that we're required to review we're also recommending that we stay with IEA uh, IEA is a consulting firm that helps us with uh, health, safety, and environmental issues on a uh, as-need basis. There's some annual work they do, but then we call them in as needed. Um, uh, come on, cooperate. <laughs> Athletic training services. Uh, we have a very uh, aggressive bid to Twin Cities Orthopedics, and we'll be working uh, with them. We'll continue to retain our uh, trainer through this process and appreciate the work that was done through the administration to make that a competitive bid. Uh, Best Buy uh, web store, that was a modification that we needed to make and we tabled it at the last meeting. That correction has been made uh, as it relates to on page two of the document. So we have the right pricing in there now. Uh, the approval of Three River Trail, we needed to get a clarification on that. We were able to do that. Uh, that does not involve the spur uh, trails or yeah, spur trails, I think that's what they're called. Spurs. Yep. Mm -hmm. Spurs, Spurs the, that'll come back. This was just finalizing our uh, routing through that, and we've worked with uh, the various personnel, uh, both uh, at the administrative level as well as the teaching level, to get that finalized, and so we're supportive of that. You can see, the, again, the um, teaching agreement with Crown College, and then we've got an appendix that we're uh, seeking to approval on around uh, facilities rental. There are some increases in that. The Finance and Facility Committee did support those increases and board's taking action on that appendix tonight. That does keep us in line with uh, what other rentals are uh, in the West Metro area. We have some commendations and then the generous gifts from uh, our community that we are, again, most appreciative for and that would take care of the consent agenda items. Thank you, Rick. Uh, any questions or comments regarding consent agenda or items that anybody would like removed from the consent agenda? I would just note that it, this, the one item, the student teaching agreement with Crown College, it says a contract is attached and there is no contract attached, but I assume that one exists. And there it is. There it is. That's, so that's it's it. somewhere. It's yes. a small contract. <laughs> 
<laughs> we can uh, delete that uh, line or insert it, and we'll leave it up to the administration how they want to fix that. Any additional items, questions, comments, items anybody wants to remove? Seeing none, all those in favor of the consent agenda as presented with the, with the exception Kathy pointed out, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. The first item on the action portion of this evening's meeting is the preliminary budget, which we had a presentation on earlier this evening. Can I have a motion to bring that to the floor? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded uh, to uh, approve the preliminary budget for 2014-15. Any discussion? I would just have one follow-up with the presentation to this comparison slide. Oh. Yes, there was a typo, so. All right. And so that has been corrected when we post to the uh, website. Um, the long-term debt for Edina is $7,786, still uh, below uh, our comparison districts in terms of long-term mm -hmm. debt. Um, makes it look a little more uh, reasonable. So just add that clarification for you and answer any questions that you might have regarding um, the presentation or the detailed materials in your board packet. Questions, comments? Thank you, Margo, very well done. Thank you. All those in favor of approving the preliminary budget as presented, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, motion carries. Uh, next up, we got the health and safety budget. Can I have a motion to bring that one to the floor? So moved. In a second. second. Moved and seconded. Uh, any discussion? Any background we should be aware of, Margo? No major changes uh, to the health and safety budget. This is uh, just a MDE compliance. It is um, this 2014-15 uh, part of the budget is included in the budget you just approved overall for the district. Uh, the MDE just requires that we have a two-year budget for health and safety. Thank you, Margo. Any questions? All those in favor of approving the 14-15 uh, and 15-16 health and safety budget, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, motion carries. Uh, next up, we have the 10-year alternative facilities uh, funding plan. Can I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, we spent time uh, recently at two different workshops uh, reviewing this. Uh, this plan was originally developed uh, in 2012. Um, any questions, comments, discussion, background, Margo? Just for uh, the public, even though we as uh, finance and facilities and the board have been working on it, um, the first initial plan was developed in 2012. Um, the state does require a 10-year plan to be annually updated and have a two-year component to it and um, we are using information from the last two years to update it and continue that in an ongoing fashion. Recommendation from administration is to continue the 10 million a year for the next two years of this 10 year plan and uh, years three through 10 have increased by 5 million to 15 million per year to address our critical uh, asset preservation or critical maintenance needs and to help with our um, uh, a backlog of deferred maintenance. Um, we are able to review this annually, and it is a 10-year plan, but know that we are able to um, continue to process through this as new information comes, whether it's internal to the district, changes we're seeing in our um, facilities, or if it's external market rates, that kind of thing. Uh, also, I did have, we at our work session, we had a slight correction to a worksheet, so I've got that too. I'm gonna answer any questions that you have. Did Margaret, I miss anything, Rick? No, do you just wanna note the correction that you're- yes. It's in the middle in. section um, where I double counted the ECC in that middle section calculation that was pointed out in the work session. So uh, the comparison to the original plan and um, the deferred maintenance backlog has been updated. The bottom portion did not change. That calculation was correct and the top portion was correct. Can you give a little historical perspective what shifted when we went to <coughs> average age of buildings and how we can use these funds now? Oh, the alternative facilities funding um, only 
there's about 25 school districts in this state that qualify and, and it has to do with average age of buildings and square footage and Edina has not always qualified we started qualifying in 07 08 and so previous to that our sources of funding were either going to the voters for approval um, every 10 years or so for um, deferred maintenance needs or um, uh, capital funds which capital funds we're about 200, maybe 400,000 a year. So there's not significant dollars there. Now that alternative facilities funding is available because we do qualify, we do need state approval of the projects. Uh, they do need, the projects need to be of a deferred maintenance uh, need, which means um, the, whether it's carpet or HVAC system, a roof or a parking lot, it needs to be beyond its useful life and replaced, um, need to be replaced so we can't just make an enhancement of something and approved by the state and we now qualify for that we two years ago um, increased that amount from we were spending about five hundred thousand a year prior to that um, and increased that amount when we had some principal and interest on our bonds coming off so that it would uh, be a minimal impact to the taxpayers and so we increased that amount to ten million a year and we have been um, systematically replacing the HVAC systems in our um, schools. The first one was Concord last summer, and Highlands and Creek Valley are up this summer. Um, improving, and the overall intent is to maintain the community's investment in our building and also maintain the learning environment. Our buildings support um, our students' learning and learning environment. Thank you, Margo. Very helpful. Uh, any questions or comments? All those in favor of approving the 10-year alternative facilities funding plan, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, next up, we have our EPAS contract renewal. A motion, please. So moved. Moved and seconded uh, to approve the 2014-2016 Edina Professional Associates of Support Staff uh, contract. Uh, Gwen, that's a mouthful. A little background, please. Yes, uh, we had negotiations with um, this particular bargaining group, which includes our clerical support staff. And I am pleased to say that um, we were able to complete the negotiations in a very best amount of time because we just have a seem to have a great relationship with them for one thing um, some of the changes that ha that are in place for this particular contract over the next two years is that um, if a if a uh, clerical person is on steps one through four there is no increase because they get the natural progression of an increase as they move from one step to the next but um, for steps if you are on step five or if they are on lo longevity they will have a 2% increase in year one and a 1.5% increase <coughs> year two. Their um, health insurance benefits are going to increase a half percent year one and 1.75% year two. And there is one particular uh, language change. We offer disaster leave language, which means that if someone has a catastrophic illness, um, it's, it has been just the staff member, but now it includes staff member and family members the way we do in the teacher's contract. And so that is one change in this particular contract. And the total compensation package is an increase of 4.42% or $137,000, which has been approved by the board HR committee. I will entertain any questions. And that 137 is over two years. Over two years, yes. Questions? Comments? Thank you, Gwen, and your team for all the work. All those in favor of approving the uh, EPAS contract, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, next up, we have the uh, workers' compensation insurance. Can I have a motion, please, to bring that to the floor? Move. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Um, a little background, Margo, please. I'm happy to report a decrease in workers' comp rates, which I haven't had that luxury in a couple of years, or a few years here. Um, we had a, a high claims year fall off our claims history, which um, then 
has a favorable impact to our premiums. So the um, decrease is a little over 16% in premium. Um, overall, salaries and workers' comp is based on your, your amount of salaries. So if salaries increase or staffing increases, workers' compensation is going to increase. I think the key notation here is the timing is right. Finance and Facilities Committee has been monitoring um, the market and when we would be able to move to a six-month renewal so that we could align workers' comp renewal with property liability insurance renewal on January 1, and the timing is now right to do that. And um, that way we can be more competi competitive possibly by combining the two or doing a bid and then selecting two separate vendors for each one depending what's more favorable to the district. And also we'll be out in the market at a different time uh, uh, when many school districts are out July 1. So um, finance and facilities recommendation and administration recommendation is to go with a six months renewal and accept um, the uh, at risk administrative services as a workers' comp provider for the district. Thank you, Margo. Mr. Wright presents a uh, decrease of 16.6%. Uh, any questions or discussion? All those in uh, favor of approving the workers' compensation insurance, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, uh, motion carries. Uh, next up, we have the bus uh, relocation uh, agreement items. Uh, can I get a motion, please? So moved. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, we've discussed this in workshops previously. A uh, little background, Margo. Um, only change from the previous meeting was uh, item number three. Rewarded that to say operational costs of the transportation department will be considered as relocation areas are evalu evaluated. And uh, we did talk about this and uh, work through this at finance and facilities, and they support it. The other thing I'll just update uh, the board too is I've been in touch with Scott Neal from the city, and there's interest of the city and the district getting uh, a task force together just to make sure that as we proceed forward with anything that we jointly are working on this rather than one trying to do the other. So there's a discussion in July that we'll probably have a small group get together to help hammer the details out and stay as a team going forward. Additional discussion? Basically this updates a 1999 uh, agreement and adds a little bit of clarity uh, and understanding from the district's perspective uh, because there appears to be, or the city at least has an interest in redeveloping where our current bus garage uh, sits, but that is our property and we, uh, um, you know, uh, need to be in control of anything that's done with that property and the option is for them or somebody else to find us an alternative uh, facility that works for us and these, this frames the parameters around that. Questions or comments? All those in favor of approving, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, secondary learning experience. Uh, hand a motion, please. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded uh, to approve the uh, motion uh, related to the secondary learning experience. Uh, great configuration. Uh, background. Rick, Randy, who wants to start? Uh, so this has been a, an area of discussion that's been going on uh, for most of the year through the implementation team, the team that's been uh, working on implementing the strategic initiatives of that secondary uh, academic plan. Um, so the implementation team did study, did the research on what would work best programmatically to meet the needs of the recommendations of our secondary academic plan. We we're also waiting to see if the birth through grade five was going to be looking at any type of grade level configuration change. As they came forward, we recognized there was not going to be a change, but we do see a benefit uh, going forward the implementation team. We took to the teaching and learning committee as well um, and brought forward to the board on, in, on June 2nd about a grade level configuration that where we'd move our middle school programming to a 6-8 grade level model and our ninth our high school level programming being 9-12. And what we're talking about right now is a future direction. We haven't declared a date. We haven't declared that, because there's a lot of things that still need to be considered before this would be formalized. Uh, in discussing this with the board on June 2nd, 
Uh, there was some uh, desire for us to do some formatting a little bit different, so we did present some background information, and I think I'll ask Susan Brott maybe to mention uh, a little bit more of the detail as she was helping coordinate uh, the background data that's included uh, in the document um, that kind of hi highlights the different models we looked at and the benefits and challenges. So as you'll recall, in, um, in January, there was a large discussion about a, a variety of different models many, many models of what we could possibly lo be looking at for secondary grade configuration. And it really kind of came down to three primary models, either keeping the current model as we have, which is a 6-9 middle and, an, and a 10-12 high school, um, looking at a 6-8 middle school, 9-12 high school, which programmatically we feel is the best um, option for students given many of the benefits in, that we've articulated. And then also uh, a possible option of what would happen if we did a 6-7 school, a 8-9 school, and a 10-12 school. And we just felt that looking at a variety of benefits and challenges that not only programmatically, um, but also looking at many of the requirements coming down with world's best workforce and legislation on ninth grade being really more attached to that high school uh, experience in terms of credits and as being on the transcripts and, and other sorts like that, we're able to be able to put the all of the ninth grade teachers together and working on that. So again, it's just a future direction, but we have identified a number of benefits and challenges that included research um, of programs across the country and across the state. It does uh, put Edina more in alignment with other high schools in the state. Um, and nationally, I think uh, the program that we've had at the high school of a 10-12 system uh, has served our district very well, but as we look to the future of what does 12th grade look like, what does um, the needs of high school students look like, this is probably, we believe that this is the better place to go at this time. Thanks, Susan. Additional questions, comments? We've had a number of workshops as well around uh, looking at these options over the years. So we're saying this is direction. This is direction which allow us to advance it so we can start doing some program planning, but also, and we'll get into as we look at facilities, as we look at uh, costs, as we look at staffing models, that we'll be able to drive that deeper and then we'll come back and do some check-in points. Um, but uh, what it would truly do is then, um, you know, scheduling. I mean, you just look at the variables that we're, we're looking at right now around time and uh, staffing, uh, programming. Um, this is what we're, uh, supporting is a direction. Additional questions or comments? This is the plan, not the, not the how, it's the what. Okay. This is the what, and now we're gonna get after the how. And see if the how, it, you know, and we're, we think we can build a plan over the next several years that would uh, help us meet this program need. Additional questions, comments? Anything else, Lisa? Anybody else? I, the option three, I think we had also talked about it looking at a six, seven at one location and an eight, 12 campus. The way it's talked about here, it's not quite looked at that way. And so, It just looks different in my head when we talk about a 6, 7, and then an 8, 12. I think that um, while it is not articulated that way, that the way that the physically it would probably work out is to try to look at what would that look like on an 8, 9, 10, 12. Um, and an 8, 12 campus, that would really be looking at a completely new kind of structure of a programmatically from an 8-9, and I think with the discussions, especially with the secondary implementation team and in talking with principals about middle school, that really being an important um, program for that exploratory time between sixth and eighth grade, and when you just isolate eighth and ninth, I mean, I know you're saying it's an 8-12 campus, but uh, that that's an awfully large grade span to try to be putting together at this point with the secondary students, so why we kind of articulated it that way and we're trying to help kind of narrow the discussion, but that certainly could be perceived that way as a six, seven on one campus and an eight, 12 on the other, but it was sort of felt that that's a lot of, the six, seven is just a pretty short period of time with a adolescent group that maybe needs a little bit more time together. 
Additional questions or comments? All those in favor, please signify saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, next up, we have our uh, power standard common assessments uh, and grading for learning. Nope. No, no, no. Do we have our own? I don't know. Do you have a missed age? We still got to do it. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, item H, location of eighth grade to uh, secondary West Campus. Can I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Been moved and seconded. Uh, discussion. Again, this is directional, but this, it does uh, set us uh, to start looking more of a 9-12 inclusive model. Um, and again, it'll be further study, but this uh, allows us to continue to advance that work uh, on a variety of our uh, resource areas, such as space, um, staffing, uh, programming, um, and so discussed at the June 2nd meeting and uh, recommended that we present it in this fashion and so administration is bringing it in this fashion. Thank you, Rick. Additional discussion? So this essentially dovetails with what we just That's approved. Correct. It's just reiterating it as east yeah, and west. I had already merged them in my mind. Oh. Yeah, that's <laughs> exactly. <laughs> discussion? All those in favor, please see the saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Now we're on to uh, uh, power standards, common assessments, and grading for learning implementation process. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the power standards, common assessments, grading for learning implementation process through policy development. Uh, Randy? I'm going to move my mic down a little bit because I drew the short straw tonight and I have the short chair. <laughs> So this is about really a phased in approach to <laughs> standards and common assessments and, and grading for learning. And we hope to develop that through, uh, as this resolution says, through policy. So it's really about um, clarifying our desired results in our grade levels and in our courses, identifying what are those absolute key standards that all students are going to leave the the classes or grade levels with of course by state law our teachers are required to teach all standards but not all standards have the same grain size weighting level of rigor depth etc so it's about prioritizing those standards so we use criteria like endurance uh, leverage readiness readiness being about uh, what do kids need for the next level and a leverage being about what do what are some things that that kids would learn that uh, give them leverage with other content areas so when you have standards that give kids leverage in other content areas like math and science and and uh, and language arts etc they are high in leverage so that's an important criteria and then endurance what are those concepts that are those big ideas that are going to carry with them and last a long time so using those criteria we, att we will attempt to identify power standards across our system assembling teams to do that work and then developing common assessments to us to create quality evidence that students have indeed in uh, have learned those power standards at a high level uh, Upon the completion of that work, we'd be assembling a task force that would be looking at next generation grading or um, uh, grading for learning. And then uh, through this process, we hope to, um, through this resolution, we hope to approve this process to move forward into policy um, for our school district. So if the board takes action on this tonight, then we would move this to the policy committee who would start looking at this in July incorporating some of these key functions into policy uh, much like we have to do, we'll be doing the same with the educational competencies that were approved on June 2nd we had a, a very good presentation at our last teaching and learning um, committee on this with um, a presentation on the um, math power standards that they've already gone through and then looking at some of the new software they'd be using to track the power standards and do the common assessments and it was very helpful for those of us who uh, don't understand 
you know, when you're throwing around power standards and common assessments, what that all means and how that would all work. And so if there's any time available, I know all our meetings are crowded, but if there's any time where we could have, you know, a presentation to the entire board and for the community to see that as well, I think that would just be very, very helpful to understand where it is we're moving and how that's really going to make a difference in our child's education. It was just a, it was one of those presentations for me that was the complete light bulb. Ah, I get it. So I would suggest that we do that. Okay. Thank you, Kathy. Additional discussion? Just, just a question, Randy. On the, dis the description of the phases and the uh, content areas and grade levels, why, why do some content areas have grades associated with them and others not? And how is it decided? Uh, what order to, to think things through? Um, I would say that um, part of our phase one was specifically looking at math at the elementary level, but we also had uh, math was probably a little bit further ahead in this journey, so uh, we had math teachers at the secondary level that were already doing some of this work, but then completing it at the elementary level in grades one through five and adding kindergarten here in the future. So some of these uh, particular content areas or courses or grade levels are areas where some of this work was already done or there was already a start to it. And then looking at other um, departments and other, um, the phase two is really just kind of getting everybody else into that mix. So there, there's no significance as to what's going to be offered at what grade based on what's listed there? No, it's more of a reflection of kind of where we've been and what we've already been doing some work in the areas of, and then what's next. Okay. Any additional questions or comments? All those in favor of approving the power standards, common assessments, and grading for learning implementation process through policy development, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you all for your work there. Uh, next up, we have uh, the superintendent's performance goals uh, paid. Can I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded uh, to an approve the superintendent's uh, $3,000 annual bonus. Uh, each year, the board uh, meets with the superintendent to review the previous year's uh, success. And at that point, we establish a framework for goals for that year. Uh, towards the end of the year, the policy committee meets with uh, Superintendent Dressen to review his successes. And uh, we did. The HR committee. I'm sorry, HR committee uh, reviews. Uh, it's been a long night. Reviews uh, <laughs> uh, Superintendent Dressen's uh, successes. And we're very pleased with his performance over this past year and the progress. He has made uh, as superintendent and with the entire district, and so we're pleased to uh, support that effort uh, by awarding his full bonus. Uh, in the packet, uh, everybody can see what the goals were and what the actions uh, has been taken as provided by Dr. Dressen, but it gives you sort of a framework of, of how we operate. Any other uh, comments? Uh, there was full support from the HR committee on this. Additional discussion? All those in favor, please signify saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, next up, we have uh, the scheduled uh, uh, review of policies uh, in the 5 and 900 series. Can I get a motion to bring those all to the floor? I was just going to ask if you need that. I'd like to move to combine uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 in um, uh, item K. Great. Can I get a second? Second. Uh, motion is on the floor to combine uh, all of the key items, one through five, which are all policies. Any discussion? All those in favor, please see the have saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, can I have a motion to bring those policies to the floor? So moved. Second. We have these policies on the floor, which we have previously uh, viewed at a prior meeting. Uh, any corrections we should be aware of from how we viewed them at the last time through? There are no changes since the board met on May 19th. Excellent. Thank you, Regina. Any discussion? Thank you. <laughs> that one's a complicated phrase. So the policies uh, we're looking at uh, is 516 is student, student medication. 
906 is uh, community notification. Uh, 907 is, I'm sorry, community relations, community notification. 907, community relations uh, rewards for solving crimes. Uh, 910 is community relations tobacco and alcohol, and uh, I can't read the rest Drug of it. Drug-free schools. Drug-free schools, and uh, the last one is uh, community relations use of volunteers in school. Discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Those policies have been approved. We're on to discussion. Uh, birth through grave five is where we start, and we did have a presentation on that this evening. Any discussion? That's a pretty good discussion at the presentation. This would come be coming back to the board uh, in July for action, and once the board does uh, take action on the uh, study, we then move it into an implementation model. And so in uh, August and September, we would roll out exactly how we'd move that uh, study, similar to what we did at the secondary level, into implementation. Comments? Questions? I know we asked some already. Okay. Uh, we'll move on to uh, committee appointments. I had a comment on this one. Just because we've run into timing issues before with our assigned as our in our roles for school liaisons and so I thought it might be really helpful just to try to get a get a time for each one of these listed out because um, I know for myself um, one, one of my assignments is Creek Valley and it always meets on a Thursday morning and most 80% of the time it meets when I'm at finance and facilities so it's become I've become not available Often. So I'm just thinking that if we could just maybe line up, you know, this typically meets the second Thursday, blah, 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 and then make the assignments based on that so that we can all make sure that we can actually be accessible. Okay. If, I would suggest if everybody who's current, everyone's currently serving, if you, everybody wants to send me, send to me the time and day that they meet on a month, I will compile that and send, we can have that then included so everyone can see it and we will be able to um, better Make the better make assignments so that people can actually go to their assigned schools. Yeah, thank you. Because I just feel guilty that I. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks, Kathy. Taking, Taking that on. Any other? Uh, typically, how we do this is summer. It's it's uh, typically the sites we shift, right. uh, unless there are some other changes, or additional committees, or elimination of committees is things we look at in the summer as well. And I note that we have a number of community members terms who are that are also up at the end of this month and so I assume we already have procedures in place to replace those? Or yes, we do. Good. Any other questions or comments? Uh, one time waiver on policy uh, 538 about the 18 month notification. This request uh, gets back to the May term um, that the board approved at the June 2nd meeting. We're looking at May term at the high school level in order for us to uh, pursue the possibility of having some academic uh, field trips over that May term. We'd need to make some uh, change simply because they could not hit that time frame that's in policy. So a recommendation was for this one year is to grant that flexibility and uh, the administration is supportive of that we've also talked about at the teaching and learning committee and the committee was supportive good catch um, we try not to violate, violate our own policies too often um, the calendar I, I don't want to get in, in, into too much of a side topic but is there any thought around calendar for next year would there, are we thinking there's going to be any changes or so is I'll that be, still in process I'll be bringing that up in the leadership discussion okay anything else on uh, this uh, one-time waiver uh, next up we have our uh, policies 514 students bullying is the first one would like to start that one you'll see that there's um, some extensive revisions to that that was um, in response to the, the state legislature passing the new bullying legislation during this session so 
um, we needed to update our definitions and our procedures so that we were um, in, um, a, in alignment with the new state law. Um, that the policy committee has not looked at these um, uh, corrections and additions to this. Um, we, because the new policy came out with sort of suggested language after we last met, but we thought it was important enough to have it in front of the board that it's here for the discussion and the policy committee will look at all these um, edits at our next meeting so that we'll have a chance to review that before it comes back to the board for approval. So there's a couple of times when I was updating it where some questions about whether how this is going to work in our system and and uh, is this really the way we want to say the language and what leeway we have within the law to change things to make it be more the Adina way. But so that's something that the policy committee will consider um, between now and our next board meeting. But wanted to get the language, um, the state language in front of you now. Thanks, Kathy, for being proactive in this and the rest of the policy members. Uh, any discussion on that one? I, I had just I had was you answered my question about it being based primarily on the new law and then it, we talk about a building report taker is this part of the new law where we have to have That's better yes. data keeping on this yes and I want to go back I was trying to get this done so we could get it in our board packet so I did okay. not go back to um, some of the original source material so I want to go back and see where we have the leeway on some of this stuff. Yeah. And uh, first week in uh, August, the uh, Department of Education is coming out with their annual workshop, and I think they'll define it further, too. So we're probably going to be a little bit afloat for a while here. But before okay. the uh, start of the school year, we should have the policy in good shape, and then we will be meeting the needs and also keeping it a safer environment for our kids. Any additional uh, questions on that one? Next up, we have uh, Educational Innovation, which is a new policy uh, 635. This is new policy language, and um, we invite the board to look at it and make any comments. It's providing some structure and guidelines behind how the district is going to pursue innovations. And what I would call attention to specifically is Section 4, just looking at when do particular types of projects and proposed innovations need board approval, when can they go forward with um, an administrative team's lead, and when, and uh, oh, basically those two categories, and also a note that our director of teaching and learning will oversee innovation projects. Let me ask a question. Do we need to define innovation, or have we defined it elsewhere? That's what I was wondering about. <laughs> Uh, I think that's a good we'll suggestion for the policy yeah. committee to look yeah, at. Some way to frame it so that yeah. it doesn't get yep. used in its innovation and so I can do X with it. Right. Who defines innovation? We'll take a look at that. Uh, any other uh, questions on the, the first read through 535? Thank you for your work on that. Uh, 808? So 808, I'd like to discuss 808 and 809 together. There's the, our proposal is that policy 809 on buildings, naming rights, buildings and sites be rescinded. The language is combined in the draft we have here of 808. The discussion at the policy committee level is that a lot of the language clearly overlaps between the two policies, so we wanted to clarify and simplify. Uh, two of the categories that we were working with is one we have names for new facilities, names for existing facilities, so that's one type of way that naming can break down. The other way of looking at this is there are some times when the district wants to recognize contributions to the district, whether it be long-term service and tenure of an individual, or it may be a contribution of goods, services, finances. The other category is a potential formal agreement that say we will name this hallway for X number of dollars. So this particular policy tries to take those concepts and navigate the impact of naming per category. Discussion, comments? 
They were two hard policies to put together and make it were. make sense in one. It took us a long time. It takes a, it took a long time, but I will say in the research I did just for drafting some language, looking at other districts and their policies, we ha I think our language is better. A lot of districts don't address these categories at all. It's a, it may be very brief, saying facilities can be named, but there really aren't many guidelines. So it's, um, it's nice to have some guidance for when that discussion comes up. Is there a, ever a term to a, na to a name? I'm just Say that again, please. Is there ever a term to a naming rights? Yes, a it's, it, yes it's in the agreement. Okay. It is it's in the policy. That's, okay. a, that's a good point. There's, um, it addresses it in a couple of different ways. Um, one, the term can be, it may, there may be a contractual agreement by which it ends. There may also be a repurposing for a site or facility that may require a name change. There may also be a decision that the it's no longer an appropriate relationship, which could happen for a variety of reasons. So there, there is language in the policy to address a need for a change. Thank you. Well done. Uh, we're on the informational items, announcements. But we didn't do parent involvement, but we're rescinding it. Because the <laughs> everything's in other policies. It's in 903, so, and the, b good catch. The reason the reason for the we're rescinding move it. to rescind is because the language is covered in policy 903 with visitors. So as we, we and we had discussion about this at the policy level. Is there anything specific to 908 that isn't covered anywhere else that requires a need for it? We didn't find a need to duplicate. Thanks, good catch. Sorry. Uh, other items? Announcements? Committee updates? Where are we at with the secondary pilot projects? So, um, you know, if we follow that policy, so we're moving on those objectives, uh, or on those various pilots that were supported because yep, with yep, yep. one time funds. So everything's moving along. Yep. Um, I will say the uh, May term project is um, you board made a waiver on the field trip policy. It's also the school calendar, and uh, there's some discussion around that. The high school has uh, done some study on how they could revise uh, the school calendar, make a couple date changes, and create some options to, to create a first semester at winter break and a second semester. But there is an imbalance in days, and it would mm. take some a teacher day here, a teacher day there, switch. Mm -hmm. And um, what we'll probably do is bring that back to the board uh, at a special meeting the board's having on May 20 or June 20th. Uh, we can kind of fly through that and see how that might look, and then the board can take it from there. It would only be for the high school for this one year, and then we'd incorporate it in. So that's where that is at. Uh, the board did discuss uh, a June 20th um, board meeting. 7.30 in the morning, again, just to move further along with our facility study and then any other leadership move that we might have. So that would be the focus of that meeting. Um, in the information, we did mention the, uh, again, just for some definition around position statements, around what personalized learning is and um, racial equity and cultural competency, um, and then also the narratives that we've now got in the student voice uh, and those again would be appendices that we'd likely incorporate into some policies, but would likely have some work done along the way. And that would conclude uh, my information sharing. Any other uh, additional items, announcements, committee reports? I think the board tonight, we had a long uh, well, night. We had a uh, work session prior. Uh, it includes some, uh, some HR issues uh, and the negotiations as well as some facilities discussion, but we know it's going to be a long night, but we're limited on time. So uh, plug that in. We'll have a little session Friday morning. I had a great graduation here not so long ago. Uh, any other announcements or additions that we'd like to add? I just had um, several members, uh, community parents, come and say how much they loved the 
the graduation at Mary Ritchie. They thought it was very personable and they could really see everybody and they just thought it was lovely. So a lot of nice comments on there. Right. Kudos to the planning team as always. Yeah, that was mm -hmm. very well done. And they picked the perfect weather day as well. <laughs> Any other items? Uh, seeing none, can I have a motion to adjourn? So, so moved. Or seconded. <laughs> it's moved and seconded. Any objection to adjourning at this time? Seeing none, we are adjourned. Thank you.